Devin Sandiford. Thank you so much for the introduction, Brun. I'm so happy you invited me. Um, I'm six years old, I'm in first grade, and it's another beautiful sunny day in California. Me and a group of the boys are running away from a group of the girls. I just started first grade. I hadn't gone to school in kindergarten. I was homeschooled. So I didn't really understand exactly what was going on, but a group of the boys had pulled me aside and they told me to watch out for the girls, that they were gonna chase after us, that they were gonna corner us, and they were gonna kiss all over us. And they told me how gross it was and they really started educating me about this rare disease that girls apparently have that's called cooties. And I, I, I knew nothing about cooties. I had just moved from Miami, Florida, and the rules of the playground were completely different in Miami. And I actually had kissed a girl. I had a little girlfriend when I was four years old. So to me, I was like, I don't know what these guys are talking about. Kissing a girl is like one of the greatest gifts God's given us. But I really wanted to fit in. So whenever they ran, I just ran too. Whenever they dodged, I just dodged. We would go between the lunch tables. We'd go behind drinking fountains and the girls would chase after us everywhere. And this was the game we played every day. And as we were playing the game though, I noticed that like, I always got away. Like I never had anybody even get close to me. And I, I was like, I'm pretty fast, but I, I just feel like I'm not that fast. Uh, so I started slowing down a bit. And I noticed over the next few days that it seemed like nobody was chasing me at all. And even when I got caught in corners with other boys, um, none of the girls would ever kiss me. They actually wouldn't even come close to me. They wouldn't touch me. And I realized that the girls were afraid of me. And I didn't understand why this was because I thought the boys had told me that the game was that the girls would chase the boys and they would try and kiss the boys once they caught us. And no matter how many times I got close to getting caught, none of the girls ever kissed me. And this really, really was painful for me to feel so different from the rest of the boys. But I said, you know what, I can, I can work with this. I can just turn this into a game of, of its own. And I decided that instead of waiting to get chased by the girls, I would chase after them and make that a big joke. And I started to chase after the girls and and sure enough, whenever I chased them, I could see that there was like just horror in their eyes. Like they were really afraid of me catching them. And it felt like actually that I had the rare disease. And that was really painful for me to go through. And I, I wanted to talk to somebody in my family about how painful it was. But I didn't want to talk to my dad because we had moved to this um, town in California for him to teach at this school. And I didn't want him to feel guilty that I hated the school. And I wanted to talk to my mom. She had homeschooled me. She taught me to read. We had this close bond. But earlier that year, before we had left Miami, my mom's brother was shot and killed by the cops on the front lawn of my grandparents' home. And my mom and my grandma were inside when it happened. And even though my mom smiled through it all, I could just sense how heavy that was for her. And I didn't want to add my little burden of some six-year-old girls to her real burden. So I figured if she can smile and live through her brother's death, I could smile and joke and live through these six-year-old girls' stares. So I just continued to play the game and I would actually moon the classroom. I'd pull down my pants and show them my butt and everybody would laugh and the guys thought I was a hero because all the girls were afraid of me when we played the game. But none of them actually knew that I wasn't trying to be a hero, that I was just trying to cover up my pain. And I just always reminded myself that if my mom could smile through her brother's death, that I could smile through this. And I could smile through the moment where I was walking home from my friend's house five minutes away and I was stopped at 13 years old, stopped, questioned, and driven home in the back of a police car because he wanted to make sure I belonged in that neighborhood, which was my own neighborhood. And I said I could just pretend like all these things didn't happen and that was fine with me except that it really wasn't fine. I really wanted to open up and share with somebody and it hurt so much that I felt like I had to go through this alone. And I didn't want to stay in this community because it hurt too much. And I finally decided at some point that, you know, I would move out to a community that was 30 minutes away. And then after that, I moved to a community that was an hour away out towards the coast in Long Beach. And then finally, at some point I decided I wanted to move across the coast to New York, the melting pot of America, and just feel like I had a place to fit in and belong. And when I was walking with my parents in their neighborhood and decided to tell them that I was moving to New York, me and my wife told them, my mom, who's usually very silent, uh, was very shocked. She had actually grown up in New York, in Brooklyn when she was young, and they escaped Brooklyn. And so this was a shock for her. 
And I remember her and my dad telling me like, no, like this is not a good decision and we have to think about it. And one particular thing that I remember was my mom's words that she said that we have to think about our sons. I had two young sons. And this hit me really hard because for me, I was moving with my sons in mind. I didn't want them to grow up in a place where I grew up where it felt like my differences were negative. I wanted them to be around people who could see their skin and think, okay, great, you're brown, but what does that matter in terms of who you are? And it just really struck me that I was moving for them and the fact that she had moved me to this neighborhood felt really painful. And I was like, I, forget it. Like, I'm just gonna move. I don't, it doesn't matter about my family. I'm excited to go to Brooklyn. And I was, I lived in New York and I was happy, been there for three years, enjoying everything about New York. There was of course things that happened that weren't great, but I loved it. Um, and then a month ago, all of these things happened around America with all of the racism. And I live in an apartment in Brooklyn that's situated right next to the Barclay Center where the uh, Brooklyn Nets play and next to the police station. So I'm right in between these two. So when all these things started happening, the police barricaded off the street where I live and there was 500, 600 cops on the street a night. And anytime I went outside the house, I just felt the tension in the air. And I just felt like any moment that, you know, there was a loud sound that there could be something wrong. Or anytime my son went out and started just pretend fighting in the air, I'd tell him, stop, like, we're not doing that right now. And sitting in my apartment, I finally realized that my choice to move to Brooklyn could be triggering for my mom who grew up in Brooklyn and who lost her youngest brother and now her youngest son is living in a place where she feels is so dangerous. And I realized that I had to call her and apologize for moving without explaining or ever telling her about any of my pain. So I called her from my Brooklyn apartment and I explained to her that it was really painful growing up in the neighborhood where she raised me. And I explained to, all, explained to her all the pains that I had felt and that it was really hard to never have heard about my uncle's life or about his death. Nobody in my family ever shared about that. And that was really confusing for me as a six-year-old. And my mom thanked me for, sh for sharing and for apologizing and for knowing that that would be a trigger for her. And then she did something I wasn't expecting. She told me about her brother's life and about her brother's death. And for the first time in my life, I saw my mom cry. And that moment was so powerful for me because I had been waiting for the time where she would open up and share to me since I was six years old. And even though we were both so much in pain for all the things that were going on, I was just so thankful to have that connection with my mom again that I had been looking for since she raised me and stayed at home with me since I was a kid. And it just felt great, even though we were in pain. Thank you.